This video is sponsored by 110 Industries. 2023 has been such a stacked year for game releases that, quite frankly, I could not keep up with them all. Even now, there are still so many titles I haven't had the time to play between my full-time job, content creation, and my attempts to get through the older games on my backlog. That being said, while I didn't experience a lot of the bigger and more popular games of the year, I did end up getting more indies and shorter titles that skipped many people's radars due to my lack of time to play something like Baldur's Gate 3. My taste in games has changed a lot over the years, and I find myself connecting more with those that do something different and are perhaps a little too weird for most. I'm very happy with the games I've chosen to cover today, and I want to use this as an opportunity to discuss titles that I think deserve a lot more attention as well as some words on those that are probably going to appear on everyone's end of year lists. There's a lot to get through, and I'll be including other recommendations, a small recap and update for my channel, as well as my usual reel of upcoming games to look forward to near the end. So be sure to stick around if you'd like to pad out your wish lists. First, let's hear about a game that meant something to me this year and the sponsor of today's video, Wanted Dead. Wanted Dead is one of the first 2023 releases I played this year, and has remained in my mind even throughout the many games that came out since. The publisher reached out recently to sponsor this video, and since I wanted to mention my experience with the game anyway, I thought it would be a perfect fit. If you ever wished for a game that had the unabashed, bizarre nature of the side stories in the Yakuza series, combined with intense, fast-paced combat mixing both swords and guns, then you're in the right place. Apart from my two favourite things making an appearance, that being Cats and Stephanie Yostin, there are also mini-games like karaoke, ramen-eating competitions, and a side-scrolling shoot-'em-up. A claw machine even makes its way into the experience, and you can bet I made sure I collected everything I could. Nice. Wanted Dead is the first title from the brand new publisher 110 Industries that has a focus on single player story driven games. It's the kind of experience that will continuously catch you off guard, with high effort put into things that you might regard as impractical. I mean, there are anime cutscenes thrown into the mix that really do add to the variety of visuals and gameplay styles existing in this unique yet wonderfully nonsensical cyberpunk world. Jacob Geller actually has a very good video on the game going into all its craziness and hilariously awkward moments, so I'd recommend watching that if you'd like to learn more about it. Wanted Dead knows not to take itself too seriously and as a result, it ends up feeling reminiscent of a fun PS3 era title where things would go off the rails in the best way possible. And by the way, the developers have just rolled out the first patch for the PC version, introducing improved quality of life with more enhancements on the way. Steam players will be the first to experience the big update right now, but console owners need not worry, as the patch will hit those platforms in just three weeks. If you're interested in an unapologetically eccentric game developed by the team behind Ninja Gaiden and Dead or Alive, I recommend trying it out. It's available on PS4, PS5, PC, both Steam and Epic Games Store, as well as Xbox Series consoles and Xbox One. And you can gear up for an epic adventure in Wanted Dead with 50% off on Steam by using the link in the description, and this special offer is applicable until January 4th. Prepare for this action-packed hybrid slasher shooter and let chaos begin. A big thank you to 110 Industries for supporting the channel. I treat video games as an opportunity to visit a new world and see the sights it has to offer, kind of like a vacation. I don't need a game to have detailed mechanics or a comprehensive story from start to finish. I just want to feel something. The Arsenal's atmosphere alone is worth the price of entry. Rooms and spaces seem alive, whether they are depressingly empty or noisily cluttered. At the very start, it feels as if you've been dropped off at the wrong spot on a cold night, but thankfully it's just a short walk to where you're meant to be. A cluster of buildings giving off a warm light not too far from you. The game's Russian-speaking inhabitants give some fairly bleak words that hone in on how there aren't really any opportunities here, 
And there's very little to do apart from, I guess, eating lays and drinking alcohol. There are plastic bags swirling in the wind and mounds of trash all over the place. Cars will sometimes whir past with less than optimal driving skills, blasting bass heavy music that fades off into the distance along with them. Even the out of bounds messages have a peculiar vibe to them. One of the first indoor scenes you'll likely find yourself in is the club. It's pounding beats audible as you approach the decrepit exterior. As I made my way up the stairs to its entrance, the deafening music pulsing from the speakers grew closer, until I was faced with overstimulating lights flashing upon the people dancing and drinking, muffled shouts poking through the music. I joined in, consuming as many drinks as I could from the surrounding tables, and dancing with the others while my camera ebbed and flowed in nauseating movements, occasionally pressing the smoke button. It is by far the most depressing and accurate depiction of a club I've seen in a game. The club's exit hilariously leads you directly into a pharmacy, where you can use a blood pressure monitor to check the health of your circulatory system. This moment unlocked a memory for me, and I remembered when I would visit Serbia as a child, and my family members would compete with each other on who has the better blood pressure reading. The architecture and culture in the game are similar to what I would see there, so as grim as some of it was, it was still homely to me. I would watch from the rooftop of a building, seeing a town centre that is foreign to me yet looks so familiar. There was also an outdoor area dotted with tables and conversations, fairy lights and autumnal coziness. I had been here before on a childhood holiday, sitting with family and eating good food. It was beautiful, and I don't think I'm ever going to be able to fully describe what it felt like to experience that again in that moment. I think there's something recognisable for everyone who plays Nayazna, whether it's resonating with a line of dialogue or the ambience of a room or place. Of course, there's also some stuff that is hilariously bizarre. For example, I walked into a store with a radio playing classical music, bought a kebab, ate it, then pet the giant rat scuttling around and contracted the plague. Later on, my screen swelled from all the virtual beers I downed as I listened to a man recite a poem on a stage in an art gallery, pretending to act sober while I watched the crowd applaud the end of his performance. The game is roughly an hour long, but in such a short amount of time, it still managed to leave a surprisingly strong mark on me. Before the Green Moon is a different take on your usual farming sim. It takes place in a small community situated at the bottom of a space elevator, where you get your own farmland to grow crops and raise chickens, all with the goal of saving up enough money to buy a ticket to the moon. This place isn't your usual cosy, magical countryside town, and is instead a fairly bleak and even slightly ugly neighbourhood which also extends to the art style of the characters too. Overall, the visual style made me see it as a kind of lost PS2 or GameCube game, so much so I actually bumped down the graphic settings to add to that feeling. The sci-fi setting brings about an alien air to its world, yet I found its oddness extremely refreshing amidst all the other Harvest Moon and Stardew Valley clones that exist. The moments of warmth and beauty dotted throughout the game are amplified by the surrounding gloominess, and over time I began to appreciate this place. The time of day is signalled by a close-up view of a small section in your current area, highlighting little pockets to admire in a new light. You can also find viewing spots around the town that show off a distant structure or landscape you can indulge in momentarily. The architecture and interiors in Before the Green Moon are often strange, and look somewhat futuristic, yet are mostly built from scraps. The nearby space elevator isn't just a large static object, it actually brings about some changes throughout the town depending on if it's docked or not. Every few days or so, people from the moon will descend upon the neighbourhood, all the while ignoring the player and littering the town with trash which you can pick up for some extra cash or simply for a sense of cleanliness. It was a contrast to the more intimate days you have with the other residents, and provided a sense of otherness between the two communities. 
In a lot of ways, I felt more isolated when surrounded by these crowds of new people. The game isn't that long and doesn't have all that much to do. There's quite literally only six characters you can engage with, although as someone who is often overwhelmed by everything there is to do in titles of this genre, I felt more compelled to get to know each individual residence more than I might have otherwise. Mechanically, the gameplay available isn't that intricate, but what impressed me the most was how you can end your time with the game. A lot of farming sims usually have the end goal be something like making a load of money, or securing a romantic partner, or saving the community. Everything will be to make a home out of the virtual space granted to you. Before the Green Moon of course lets you do that too, but it also gives you the option to leave it all behind, and for me that was the most special part. All the other farming and life sims I've played are basically infinite. You might have a main quest of sorts, but everything still continues afterwards. I prefer a sense of closure with the games I play, so having that present in Before the Green Moon made it feel like I could actually let go of what I'd built in the 12 hours I played the game. I was ready to move on, and that process was actually accounted for in the game experience. It was bittersweet saying goodbye to the characters I had gotten to know so well, sometimes even a little painful, but it still felt better than just closing the game once I got bored of it with no real conclusion or consequence. I can jump back into Stardew Valley after multiple years and nothing will change. It's like I've never left, which can be nice of course, but I loved being able to experience an actual reaction to my departure. I really hope future farming sims can experiment more with their mechanics and stories, and I think this is a great game to play if you want to see something new in an otherwise oversaturated genre. I love when games possess that Studio Ghibli feel, whether it's in its gameplay or art direction. Titles like Sable, the Boku no Natsuyasumi series, or any Fumito Ueda game all have this strong essence, and I can associate each of them with one or several movies in the Ghibli catalogue. I personally prefer when these virtual experiences don't just use the appearance as their similarity, but are also able to convey the whimsical melancholy that I love so much via their mechanics or stories. Even though Ni no Kuni, for example, quite literally involved the studio in some parts of its creation, it never really managed to provide me with the kinds of themes I'm drawn to, and that's where Season A Letter to the Future comes in. It's a game about collecting memories in a world where a mysterious event will wash everything away, and explores the beauty in the smallest of things, but also the impermanence of it all. It's basically the video game version of Mono no Aware, a Japanese phrase that describes the pathos of things, and an awareness and appreciation of their inevitable ends brought by the passage of time. As you ride your bicycle through the stunning backdrops of the game's setting, you document the sights, sounds, and words you found most important, filling the pages of your in-game journal. You can speak to other characters and unearth the history that takes root in these places, going at your own pace as you take in your surroundings. It almost seems more like a poem than a game, which you can definitely see in its writing and dialogue. But if you're looking for a truly meditative, gentle, yet melancholic experience, Season will welcome you with open arms. Unfortunately, this game is a prime example of the worst side of the industry. Scavenger Studio laid off over half of its developers, stating that Season did not meet their commercial expectations. In my opinion, this is an exaggerated and shameful reaction to a problem that probably would not exist had they put more effort into marketing and I remember people saying how they had no idea this game came out despite being interested after watching its initial trailers. Season has overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam alone, and I can't believe that developers can make such impactful games to then be rewarded with losing their job. Over 6,000 workers in the industry have been laid off this year, so while we've gotten some seriously amazing titles in 2023 that deserve celebration, I think it's crucial to be aware of the human cost that exists under the surface. I really hope this side of the industry can make serious changes, 
and developers can continue to make the games we love with all the stability and protection they deserve. Impressively made by one person, Swollen to Bursting Until I Am Disappearing On Purpose, shortened to Swollen to Bursting, is a surreal RPG maker game about a flying saucer that crashes in a town called Vomit. You take control of a post office worker, and uncover the secrets lying within the mysterious spacecraft. Much like Yume Niki, the plot and visuals are very abstract, and require the player to find different effects, which, when equipped, change the protagonist's appearance and ability. Locating these effects and their uses unlock new areas in order to progress. But there is also a light combat feature where the person with the highest level wins the battle. In the case of having a lower level, you will immediately lose and be kicked out of the game. However, I believe this is being updated in about a month and you'll just be put back to your last save instead. Regardless, I highly recommend saving often to make sure that any loss of progress is minimal. Obviously, Earthbound and Yume Niki are massive influences on the game, and I'd even say they're required playing to not only appreciate the references, but also fully understand how to make your way through Swollen to Bursting. Many actions needed in the game can be quite obscure if you're unaware of certain tropes associated with those kinds of RPGs. Like finding pathways by walking into a specific part of a wall that looks like a normal boundary. It's tough talking about the puzzle aspect of gameplay since I don't want to give solutions away, but so long as you make sure to equip the effects you find and talk to NPCs, you should be given enough hints to move forward. Everything about this game is so wonderfully bizarre and oftentimes eerie. Story-wise, while it does feature a good bit of humour, it also covers some very dark topics, so don't let the cute side of the visuals fool you. On that note, I also want to say that if you ever wanted to play a game that has the same vibe as Petscop, this definitely scratches that itch. Swollen to Bursting's aesthetic, while sporting some clear influences, still feels like nothing I've ever played before. Its use of colour and both 2D and 3D elements was just so perfect at portraying a dreamlike world with its strange varying themes. And if we're just talking art style, this is one of the top contenders for my favourite visuals in a game this year. As far as I know, there are three endings in the game, and hunting all of them down is something I don't think I'm smart enough to do. But my playthrough for the one I got was just under two hours. The game is free to play on Steam, which feels like daylight robbery, but at least you don't have an excuse to not try it out. Corn Kid 64 is the most nostalgic title I've played in years. Every aspect feels so accurate to the late 90s, from its music to its visuals, complete with a 4x3 aspect ratio and scan lines. When I was a kid, I would play Spyro every time I visited my friend's house, and playing Corn Kids was like being in that same memory, but scaled to my current gaming experience I've acquired over the many years since. It has that same magical quality I felt in games during my childhood, but now with a level of challenge I currently enjoy. It definitely took a lot of deaths getting to the credits of the game, which could also be due to me not normally playing 3D platformers anymore. But either way, getting to grips with the character's movement was a worthwhile journey for me. The animations within the game are overflowing with personality, and every step, turn and jump felt as good to execute as it did to look at. It's got a lot of polish, that reminded me of how I would often see many older titles that maybe weren't as smooth to control as I had remembered due to my nostalgia. Except Corn Kids actually does feel very good to play. The game doesn't overstay its welcome at all, and its relatively few levels managed to unravel themselves in ways that kept up my high level of excitement from start to finish. Learning new abilities and finding secrets tucked away inside the world was always an extra boost of joy in my seven hours or so with the game. The collectibles also offer an extra challenge for players who want more than just the main levels. And while I didn't get them all during my playthrough, I am tempted to go back and find them now that achievements are available too. The characters and environment design are vibrant and charming, providing a light-hearted aesthetic to accompany the simple yet fun dialogue and story. Playing Corn Kids 64 really feels like travelling in time, 
and is a phenomenal love letter to that era of 3D platformers that still effortlessly carves out its own identity. I absolutely love the game, and will be keeping an eye out for updates and any future projects from the developer. It's by far the most unsurprising and popular game on my list with over 9,000 Steam reviews, but I had to give a spotlight to Bomb Rush Cyberfunk, my favourite indie game of the year. Jet Set Radio is an all-time favourite of mine, and seeing something so faithfully recapture the visual identity of that game while still adding its own flavour is more than I could ever dream of. Even Hideki Naganuma has a few amazing tracks in the game, but the rest of the music was still incredibly catchy and a perfect companion to the funky, futuristic style of the game world. I adore the environment and character design, so exploring every corner of it was something I took great joy in doing. There are plenty of different playable characters and outfit variations to unlock, giving you plenty of reasons to explore all of the content that Bomb Rush has to offer, so I took the time to ensure I could savour every part of it. I'm nowhere near as good at the game as some of the other players I've seen online but I did spend enough time to learn the skills needed to conquer all the challenges. Eventually, I got to a point where I could flow through areas with relative ease, feeling like I've mastered the virtual playground presented to me. You can change the music that plays through your phone so long as you have collected the tracks in the open world, and I would jump on the game for hours at a time, simply skating around, building up combos and listening to my favourite music. There are slight differences in the kinds of moves you can pull off, depending on if you're using a skateboard, roller skates, or bike. And subsequently, certain challenges or obstacles will require the appropriate set of wheels. It gives good reason to test out the options available, and not just stick to one thing. Speaking of which, I personally played the game on PS5, but I've seen some wild mods for the game on PC, so I'm pretty tempted to buy it on Steam as well. Good traversal and visuals are a sure way to get me to click with a game, but as you can probably gather from some of the other titles I've mentioned in this video, I'm a sucker for nostalgia. It's important to note that it does offer more than just replicating Jet Set Radio. It improves upon controls and adds a more fleshed out narrative. That's not to say JSR suffered from it, as I think its bold simplicity is its strength. Although I think Bomb Rush definitely made the right choice in creating some distance from its clear inspiration. I assumed that I wouldn't care for the story, but I ended up being pleasantly surprised by how much went into it and the moments and levels it provides. I had extremely high hopes for Bomb Rush and it somehow delivered even more than that, solidifying it as one of the best games you could play from this year. Before I get to gushing about the AAA games I adored this year, I'd like to shed some light on a few other worthy mentions. Arctic Eggs is a short game by the Water Museum that was made for the Big Mode Game Jam. It's a sci-fi cooking game where you serve up fried eggs, among other things, to the hungry people in the area. Controlling the frying pan is surprisingly difficult, but boy did I feel like the sickest chef in town finally being able to flip around those fried eggs and cigarettes. The vibes are immaculate and this is for sure a virtual world worth visiting. There are currently some known issues which can't be fixed until after the game jam is over since it's already been submitted, but I got through it just fine and didn't even realise that the weird mouse sensitivity wasn't intentional, so maybe I'm just a hardcore gamer. I don't play multiplayer games that often, and when I do, I usually just play CSGO if I want to numb my brain. This year, however, Lethal Company made huge waves in the online space, and I thought I'd give it a try. It quickly ended up being a favourite of mine this year, even though I don't have nearly as many hours in it as other people, and seeing indie games blow up in popularity to this extent is always cool to see. I'm laughing pretty much the entire time I play Lethal Company, and I've been loving all the updates and mods that have been coming out for it too. Lake Haven Chrysalis is a prequel chapter for the upcoming survival horror game Lake Haven. I was really impressed by it and how it replicates the PS1 aesthetic so well. It's one of those games that wears its inspirations on its sleeve. So much so there is a certain secret area that Silent Hill fans will really appreciate if they so happen to find it. 
Overall, Chrysalis captures the classic survival horror feel perfectly, and I can't wait to play the main game when it's out. Finally, I want to give some attention to Misery Chord Volume 1, which is the first part in a visual novel series that is based in a convent in 1482. It's a murder mystery that follows a group of nuns after one of them was killed, and the protagonist has to dig around and find out who did it. There aren't any branching choices or anything, and it is strictly linear, but don't let that deter you in any way. The visuals alone are really well done, and helped build a world that I became very invested in. There's a staggering amount of music in the game with over a hundred songs, which also complement the changing atmospheres of Misery Chord. Also, from what I understand, both the soundtrack and the game were made by one person. I don't normally play visual novels, and it's rare that one can hold my full attention until the end, but the characters, relationships, and setting of the game were too charming to not want to know what's going to happen next. I'm intrigued to see how the story develops in the future volumes, and if it's as good as this first part was, it could end up having a bigger section in a future end of year video. In terms of the bigger titles of the year, I would like to say I played a decent chunk of the releases we got, so I'll speak on some of my favourites. I received a key from Square Enix for Final Fantasy XVI when it came out, which was a big moment for me since I'm a fan of the series. And while it hasn't beaten 12 for my favourite Final Fantasy game, it was still a brilliant experience with some of the greatest boss fights I've played through in a long time. I will say though, I'm not that into Game of Thrones, and 16 feels very similar in tone and certain story elements. However, I've always enjoyed Final Fantasy for its wildly contrasting installments, and playing through a much darker and mature rated title in the franchise was a good experience. I was looking to spend more time on my Switch this year, and Tears of the Kingdom certainly provided. In fact, there's a particular new area in the game that I was obsessed with as soon as I unlocked it. This environment reminded me so much of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, with its odd vegetation and life forms existing within it, and activating all the light routes was something I did before touching virtually any of the main story. In my opinion, Zelda games and Ghibli movies go hand in hand and I think Tears of the Kingdom feels like the ultimate testament for that similar atmosphere, touching upon different elements of the studio's works from the light-hearted to the painfully emotional. The building mechanic and sky areas were also a welcome addition for me, which got me to pour in even more hours of playtime into the game, something I didn't think would happen to the extent it did. I'm sure no one is surprised that I'm bringing up Resident Evil 4 Remake, but the week of its release was probably the most fun I had this year. I took some days off work, bought snacks, and stayed up until midnight to play it, and I didn't even record my first playthrough, which is something I usually do with every game. I wanted to just enjoy my time with it, and not have to analyse it in preparation for a video or make notes as I was playing. I can't even explain how happy I was jumping into Leon's shoes and experiencing such a beloved title in a new package with its familiar characters and places. It was everything I had hoped for, and I could not stop playing it until I completed all the achievements and finished it on every difficulty. In fact, it would be my game of the year if not for a little game called Alan Wake 2. I actually didn't really click with the first game, but after hearing that the sequel was going to be a full-on survival horror, I felt that it would be something really special. I loved Control so much, and I'm really glad that Alan Wake 2 took a page out of its book and went all out with its surrealism and mixed-media style. It felt so fitting for their shared universe and was a breath of fresh air in the medium to the point where I hope that we see even weirder games being made by large studios in the industry. I don't want to delve too much into what specifically makes the game so great because of spoilers, but there is a notorious section that does win the hearts of many, which I'll leave you to see for yourselves if you haven't already. My time in and around Bright Falls was as cosy as it was eerie, 
and the way the narrative is presented in the game had me putting together the pieces even after the credits rolled. One of the biggest things to happen to me this year was hitting 100k on YouTube. Which, first of all, thank you so much. And second of all, my channel has received shoutouts over the years from all sorts of creators, including Super Eyepatch Wolf and Rasputin to name a few. The different kinds of support I got from other channels really helped me, and I can't explain how grateful I am to those people. Because of that, I want to take some time to highlight some of my favourite creators who are currently under 100k, in the hopes that I'm able to pass on some of the success and love that you have all shown me. The first person I want to talk about is Mara Ganga, who you can see has some seriously cool thumbnail designs to accompany the great selection of games being shown on the channel. If you like hearing about the more obscure games that exist, I highly recommend watching her videos which range from discussing older games to modern indies. Thanks to her, I discovered Planet Laika and Flower Sun and Rain, so I'm always looking forward to learning about new titles through her videos. Their bio also reads Style is Substance, which I absolutely stand by as someone who is heavily influenced by visuals in games, so it's nice to see someone dive into that side of things in such a thoughtful way. Next up is Pim's Crypt, a horror creator who analyses both games and movies of the genre. My favourite is their video on how the internet changed found footage horror, and something that is so obvious when watching Pim's work is their high level of passion and effort when it comes to making it. I also always come away with a new appreciation or understanding of the media they discuss, and they manage to come up with interesting angles and ideas for every video, which is impressive in its own right. They recently uploaded a long form video on Alan Wake 1 and 2, and while I haven't had the time to sit down and watch it just yet, I already know it's going to be some really good stuff. If you watch YouTube, you've definitely seen a thumbnail by Hot Cider, and not just the ones on my channel. But apart from creating the most iconic images on your homepage and sub feeds, he also makes equally fantastic videos too. From Pizza Tower to Time Splitters, his commentary and presentation is always top notch. And it really is a joy hearing his thoughts on the game design and mechanics of the titles he covers. His output is quite frankly superhuman, but most importantly never at the detriment of quality. Whether it's several minutes or half an hour long, there's always something to be gained from indulging in his work. Hot Cider has a stacked library of great videos, and if I had to pick one, I really recommend watching indie games that make the alien human. Heavy Eyes channel is one that never fails to deliver some of the most hard-hitting and emotional videos on the platform, and dives into topics that I really don't see being talked about anywhere else. Their thoughts on things like music and games are very well spoken and informative, and as someone who is terrible at putting words together to analyse music, it really is a delight to watch him speak about the soundtracks of game series like Final Fantasy and Zelda. He isn't afraid to get personal and it adds a deeply human touch to his work that there's always something to connect with. His latest video, The Best Year for Games, takes a look at the reality of the game industry this year underneath the major releases and success we see at the surface, and you should definitely go give it a watch. You may already be familiar with the lovely Tango Mushi if you're a fan of videos on horror games, but for those of you who are unaware, Tango makes impressively detailed essays and retrospectives on both the iconic and obscure titles within horror history. Every video is meticulously researched and well presented, so if you're a fan of Japanese games and survival horror, you will absolutely adore the work on display here. Hungry Ghosts is a Japan-only PS2 game that receives coverage on the channel, and I love hearing about titles that never made it to the West. So watching Tango's deep dive into the game was honestly really enlightening. Please do go check out all the channels I've mentioned if you're looking for some quality YouTube content, and be sure to subscribe to them so you don't miss any of their future work too. This year has been pretty big for me in a lot of ways. If you're a longtime viewer, you may have probably noticed that I've pivoted more towards horror content in 2023, 
which is partially because I love the genre and will never get sick of talking about it, but also because those were the videos that tended to do a lot better in terms of performance in previous years. Until my Shattered Memories video, I wasn't sure if I would ever be able to make YouTube into a full-time job, but slowly I started to understand the kind of content I want to make, and also saw a lot more growth. Like many people, my current full-time job is miserable, so the possibility of being able to do something I love which also pays the bills is a dream. In 2024, I really want to push myself to make the best videos I can, while also saving up to quit my current job so I don't have to worry about the financial side of things, at least for a little while. To be honest, I am exhausted. And balancing my channel and everything else in my life for the past few years has been tough. But as much as YouTube is a way out of my situation, it's also my passion and creative outlet. Obviously, I do need to take on more sponsorships and things like that to be able to reach my goals. But I also want to stick to products, services, and games that I actually like and use. So yeah, I just wanted to have that transparency and I hope that's okay with everyone. Simply watching my videos is incredibly supportive in itself, and things like Patreon and merch are there in case people want to go the extra mile, but of course aren't expected. It actually blows my mind how generous everyone is, from becoming patrons to taking the time to leave kind comments on my videos and subscribing. And for that I want to say thank you to everybody who has supported me in any way, shape or form this year. It means so much to me and has always motivated me to work as hard as I can to make stuff you can enjoy. I have what feels like an infinite list of ideas for videos, so I hope you can look forward to that. And if there are any games that you'd like to see me cover in particular, I'm always curious to know what those are. Apart from new videos, there are also going to be many, many exciting games releasing in 2024 and beyond so I'd like to showcase some of the titles in my usual end of year reel, and in case there are any that catch your eye, I'll have the names at the top left corner.
thank you so much for watching as always, and a huge thanks to my patrons who have been a massive help in supporting me and my channel. I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas and New Year, and I'll see you in 2024.